Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Ao Wang, and I'm a PhD student from George Mason University. So I will be talking about the Infinity Cache, which is a cost effectiveness and high performance in memory cache. And I will show how we design it on top of the serverless computing platform. This is a joint work in collaboration with the University of Nevada, Reno, and IBM Research Amazon. So nowadays, the web applications are everywhere in our daily life. We have the Netflix provides the video streaming, and the Instagram, WeChat, and Twitter provides the social media platform. Dropbox and the Docker Hub offer the cloud storage. All those web, web applications are storage intensive. There are so many data need to be transferred between the applications and the backend store. So each application will consist of multiple fine-grained microservices in which the I.O. behavior is heterogeneous and complexity. To quantify this complex I.O. behavior in those storage-intensive applications, we select IBM Docker registry traces as an example and conduct a case study. The traces we use are collect from IBM Cloud Container Registry Service across 75 days during 2017. And we select the two busiest data centers in our study, which are Dallas and London. So we found some interesting insights in the following three points. The first one is the object sizes. We found the object sizes are extremely variable, which will span over nine orders of magnitude from several bits to multiple gigabytes. And 20% of the objects are larger than 10 megabytes. And second, we also found more than 30% of large objects are got access to more than 10 times. And around 45% of large objects, which means objects larger than 10 megabytes, are reused within one hour. And so we believe it is benefit to cache the large objects just in case they will be accessed soon. But it is a challenge to cache the large objects. Based on our uh, study, more than 95% of storage footprint is occupied the objects over 10 megabytes. So uh, if we want to cache both small and large objects in a limited capacity in memory cache, the large objects will cost a lot of memory space and the bandwidth resources. This will definitely cause the severe tension between the small and large objects. So in the presence of the, those challenges, let's check how the existing cloud storage solu solution, how to handle those storage intensive web applications. Existing cloud storage solution exhibit the trade-off between the monetary costs and the performance. Uh, here is a 2D scatter plot. Uh, the x-axis is the monetary cost of the cloud storage services, and the y-axis is the performance in terms of latency. The both dimensions are the lower, the better. The large objects are always stored and managed by cloud object stores, which are cheap, just like AWS S3, which is a typically used object storage. It only charges the tenants at around two cents per gigabyte per month. But the cloud tenants need to compromise the long latency since the object storage cannot deliver the best performance. On the contrary, the small objects are always cached and accelerated by the in-memory caching systems, such like the Redis and Memcached. But those in-memory cache services are not quite cost efficiency because the AWS Elastic Cache, it will charge the cloud tenants at around two cents per gigabyte per hour. So if we want to utilize those in-memory uh, caching system to cache the large objects, the large one will occupy the majority of the memory space and cause a lot of eviction on the small objects. So if we want to, to uh, sustain the both small and large one, so we need to enlarge the capacity, but this solution will cost uh, too much money. So the result is the cloud tenants is a dilemma where to cash in the small and large objects is challenging with the existing cloud storage solutions because the services are either too low or expensive. 
So the fundamental research question going to be asked here is, how can we combine the both best part of both worlds from the cheapest cloud storage and the fast in-memory caching systems? So this requires the researcher to rethink to build a new cloud ca caching system, which can c achieve the cost effectiveness and high performance. And to this end, we build and implement the Infinity Cache, which is a cost effectiveness and high performance in memory caching solutions, which built fully on top of the serverless computing platform. And Infinity Cache is motivated by the following two novel insights from the serverless computing. The first one, the CPU and memory resources in the serverless functions are essentially paper use. And second, the serverless functions will be cached for a short term for, uh, for free by the service provider while the functions are not being act uh, actively running. Infinite Cache could inherit the paper use charging model to achieve the really cost efficiency and the free function caching essentially can make it possible for us to leverage the service function to build a high performance in memory cache systems. So before diving into the design detail for the Infinity Cache, I would like to briefly talk about the background of the serverless computing, just in case you are not very familiar with this, the new emerging uh, computing platform. So uh, serverless computing is a really new uh, computing paradigm, which this can enable users to just upload their function code to the cloud. And the user only needs to worry about their logic of the functions. And the cloud provider will maintain the function running environments. Also, it would provide the high elasticity and the fine grain charging model. And serverless function is the most basic unit of the deployment and execution. It, uh, you can treat the serverless function as a container which encapsulates the CPU and memory resources. And the applications always consist of single or multiple serverless functions. The popular use cases uh, always include the backend APIs, data processing, image processing, and so on. And the serverless computing model is attractive because it has two competing features. The first one is the paper use in charging model. Uh, we just use AWS Lambda as an example. The Lambda will charge the user include two parts. The first one is the invocation cost, and the second one is the resource usage cost. And the next appealing feature is uh, it provides the transparent short-term caching for the functions that are not being triggered, and this is for free for the user. So our ultimate goal is to leverage those service computing model and to exploit it uh, with the two competing features to build a cost effectiveness and high performance in memory cache. But to build such a caching system may be introduced a lot of challenges since there are some limitations on the compu service computing. The first one is the data availability cannot be guaranteed in the service functions because the cloud providers will, be, will reclaim the service function at any time, and the states in the memory would be lost. Second, the inbound network is banned by the service providers. You cannot treat the service function as a single server as traditionally easily. So it is necessary to make the, each server function connectable. And last, the resources like memory, CPU, and bandwidth in service functions are limited. So there are at most three gigabytes and two CPU cores could be utilized by clients. Uh, this is in the AWS Lambda uh, scope. So to this end, uh, we have designed and implemented the Infinity Cache, which is a memory caching system built atop serverless functions. Infinity Cache comprehensively combines the multiple sets of techniques, including the Eureka coding, Delta Sync backup, and Parallel I.O. in order to build a holistic, cost-effectiveness, high-performance in-memory caching system and maintain a good data availability. So more importantly, the Infinity Cache could achieve the, uh, improve the cost-effectiveness by two, more than two orders of magnitude compared to 
AWS Elastic Cash. So here is the outline of my, the rest of my talk. I will introduce the design of the Infinity Cash first, and I will show you how the Infinity Cash perform under the real world production workloads. And last, I will conclude our work. So let's first focus on the Infinity Cash overall design. Unlike other traditional caching systems, our client side has two major parts. The first one is the Infinity Cache client library, which will perform the eraser coding related encoding and decoding jobs. And it will let the applications directly talk to the proxy server. And the proxy server is the, the, the second part of the client, library, uh, client side, which will be responsible for the Lambda, ma Lambda cache node management and request the routing where it will forward the request to corresponding Lambda cache node with the specific Lambda function ID. And the Lambda cache pool in the bottom of the figure is our backend storage size. It will consist of multiple cache nodes, and each cache node will establish the TCP connection to the proxy server. And each cache node represents a single Lambda function which will have a unique ID. And the user could deploy multiple Lambda cache pools, and each Lambda cache pools will be managed by each proxy server. So to share the backend uh, Lambda, cache uh, Lambda cache nodes, the user will use the consistent hashing in the client library uh, to coordinate the multiple Lambda cache pool. So I'm going to go over the design details by the example of put and get requests. So the first, let's see how the Infinity Cache handles the put request. The applications will send the put request and gonna insert the data into the Lambda Cache pool. And the Infinity Cache client library will first split the object and encode it with the K data shards and R parity shards based on the read Solomon eraser code. In this example, the, co the configuration of read Solomon eraser code is two plus one. So the object X is, has been split to three parts. The D1, D2 is the par uh, data shards, and the P1 is the parity shards. In step number two, the object chunks are sent to the proxy in parallel, and the proxy will handle the object remapping and eviction. And then the proxy will invoke the corresponding lambda cache nodes based on the mapping knowledge he has already known. And after the invocation request, the sleeping lambda cache nodes and the previously cached TCP connection on this function will be woken up. And the proxy will stream the data chunks to the lambda cache nodes by the TCP connections. And this is the get request. To handle the get request, the applications will send the get request first, and the proxy will receive this request. Then it will invoke the associated uh, corresponding Lambda cache node with the specific ID from uh, already stored mapping information. And also the TCP connection and the uh, Lambda runtime will be working up. So the, after the TCP connection resumes, the data chunks would be transferred, to, transferred back to the proxy with already uh, cached the TCP connection. And here we do a first D optimization. The straggler would be dropped during the procedure of data transfer. In this example, the lambda which stores the D2 has, uh, is struggling for some reason. So in order to minimize the impact of the, latency, uh, of the tail latency, the proxy will simply discard the slowest data chunks, which is D2 in this example. And so in this case, we, the, the read Solomon eraser code configuration is two plus one. So the straggler data can be tolerated is, is only one. And the next, the proxy will directly forward those data chunks and stream those data chunks to the client library in parallel. And upon receiving the enough data chunks of the request, the client library will decode it and reconstruct the full object uh, with the reader code if necessary. So in this example, 
the proxy uh, receive the D1 and P1, and the client library will reconstruct it to D1 and P1 to the object X, and the object X will return to the application. So in some other cases, maybe the D2 chunk will be lost for some reason. So after the object reconstruction, the client library will recover the D2 chunks and reinsert this chunk to the corresponding Lambda cache node. So this is so-called erasure coding recovery in Infinite Cache. And Infinite Cache adopts three intelligent in techniques to maximize the data availability, which are erasure coding, periodic warm-up, and periodic delta sync backup. And we have already talked about how the erasure coding works to enhance the data uh, availability in Infinite Cache. Next, uh, I will focus on the, the, the last two parts and to max, uh, how, how those techniques to maximize the data availability on Infinite Cache. So we use uh, AWS Lambda as an example. The Lambda cache nodes are cached by Amazon for a short term when there is no incoming requests. And the Lambda function would be reclaimed at any time by the service providers. So we conduct a long-term empirical study to see how the uh, AWS Lambda uh, reclaims uh, those functions. And here we pick the two representative curves which we draw in August 19 and January 20. The x-axis is the timeline of 24 hours, and the y-axis is the number of function reclaimed, in, uh, uh, the number of function reclaimed. And we deploy 300 lambda function in this experiment. As shown in this plot, uh, the lambda function reclaiming activity uh, activity spikes periodically at around, uh, the frequency at around a few hours. So in this example, if Infinite Cache were to invoke the Lambda function in every nine minutes, we would observe the massive reclaiming events where almost all the 300 Lambda cache nodes will be reclaimed at the same time period. In contrast, if Infinite Cache invoked invoke the Lambda function in every one minute, this would dramatically reduce the function reclaiming rates uh, to, a minimal, to a minimal level. So motivated by our observation, we propose this periodic warm-up strategy to enhance the data availability in Infinite Cache. The proxy will invoke all the Lambda cache nodes periodically to extend their lifespan. And the next part is the periodic backup. So in order to further maximize the data availability, we propose this technologies. Uh, each Lambda cache node would create its own peer replica, meaning each function deployment has two replicas. And when the proxy sends out the backup command, uh, each Lambda cache node performs the delta sync data backup transfer, data transfer to their peer replica through the relay. The relay is a process co-located with the proxy server. And next, let's see how the Infinity Cache handles the Lambda cache node failure. For example, when the proxy invokes the Lambda with a GET request, but the primary Lambda got reclaimed for some reason, and the AWS will automatic, automatically make the backup Lambda invoked. In other words, the peer replica of this reclaimed Lambda functions, which is the dark blue Lambda in this figure, would be the primary Lambda from, from now. And the failover is automatically done by exploits the auto-scaling feature in the AWS Lambda. And next, let's see how the Infinity Cache performs under the real-world production workloads. And we deploy Infinity Cache on top of AWS Lambda uh, with 400 Lambda functions. And our clients runs on one C5N 4X large EC2 instance. And the warm-up and the backup perform in every one minute and five minutes, respectively. All the components are running under the one AWS VPC network. And also, we replay the first 50 hours of the Dallas data centers uh, from IBM Docker registry production workloads. Here we have two different workload setups. The first one is uh, all objects, which means we include all the objects in this 50 hours experiments. The second one is the large object only, meaning we removed objects smaller than 10 megabytes. And we first quantify how the Infinity Cache 
uh, will the will have the different monetary cost compared to Elastic Cash. And the Elastic Cash will use one cache R524 X large nodes with a total six hundred uh, six hundred gigabytes memory capacity, which will incur uh, more than ten dollars per hour. So in this fifty our experiments, the Elastic Cache will cost around $518. But in contrast, the Infinity Cache only costs around $20 on all object workloads and $16 on the large object only workloads. The cost differences in Infinity Cache between those two different workload setup is because there are a lot of small objects existing in the all object workloads, and those uh, majority of small objects will induce the more invocation cost on lambda functions. And Infinity Cache can improve the cost effectiveness 31 times compared to Elastic Cache. We also did an experiment on Infinity Cache which we disabled the backup procedure and the cost reduced to, five, reduced to only $5, which improved 96 times the cost efficiency compared to Elastic Cache. And this table shows the heat ratio summary in each workload setup and the two different caching systems. And here we can observe there is a trade-off between the monetary cost and the heat ratio. If the cloud tenants want to uh, disable the backup procedure in Infinite Cache, the cost eff effectiveness will improve three times, but they will sacrifice around 7% of heat ratio, which will lower the cache caching performance. So this is, will be a control knob exposed to the client, uh, depending on how much money they want to cost and how, the good, how good data availability they want to achieve. And in short, the Infinity Cache could improve the cost effectiveness 31, time, 31 to 96 times compared to Elastic Cache. This is because the cloud tenants uh, need to pay the bill to the Elastic Cache, no matter if the request is hitting on it. But in the Infinity Cache, the cloud tenants do not need to pay for the Lambda function where it will not run it. And next, uh, let's shift our eyes to the Infinity Cache latency performance. Here is the latency CDF plots in two different workload setups. The x-axis is the end-to-end -end latency, and the blue, blue line represents the Infinity Cache. Uh, we can first focus on the left side of the plots. Uh, in the all object workload setup, Infinity Cache cannot deliver the best performance compared to Elastic Cache. This is because Elastic Cache is optimized for the caching small objects. And, but in the left side of the, 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 the plot, in the large objects only workloads, we can see the Infinity Cache gets nearly the same performance compared to Elastic Cache. And more importantly, Infinity Cache could improve the performance more than 100 times compared to AWS S3 object stores. And this plot contains the same information but shows the normalized latency to Elastic Cache as a function of, of object sizes. We could see how the object sizes impact the latency on those three, la uh, those three systems. If we look at the life set of the plot first, Infinity Cache has a relatively long latency on the small object sizes. This is because in, under the Infinity Cache, we need to invoke the Lambda functions, and the Lambda f invocation latency is around 13 milliseconds, which will dominate the latency in the fashion small objects. And in contrast, on the right side of the plot, uh, thanks to our parallel I.O., the Infinity Cache could achieve completely higher performance than Elastic Cache in the large, large object scenario. So in conclude, uh, I have shown how we exploit the emerging service computing model and leverage the several intelligent techniques to build an in-memory caching system. And with the result in the system that we built, Infinity Cache could achieve high performance and cost effectiveness while maintaining good data availability. And most importantly, Infinity Cache could improve the cost effectiveness by 31 to 96 times compared to Elastic Cache. And the Infinity Cache is already open sourced. You can find it at the Mason Leap Lab. We'll come to fork it and play with it. With that, I conclude my talk. I'm thankful for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.
Yeah, I would like to confirm with you that you said that uh, a lambda does not have to run, but it still can um, serve the read and get uh, request. Is that true? Oh uh, no. Uh, uh, to serve the get or uh, or put, we need to invoke the lambda function first. Yes. So when the get and uh, when the get and put uh, uh, issued, the lambda function needs to be active running. Uh, but if that's the case, uh, the cache, the lambda, constantly serving request, and then it has to be constantly run, right? uh, and then they need to incur this cost. Uh, the warm up is uh, it will trigger the lambda function in every one minute. Yes, you need to pay for the warm up cost, but. But uh, the, after warm up, and then they serve the request, right? Yes. Constantly put and get request, and then uh, it, it's just constantly charged uh, for the use of this cache. Is, is that the case? So you actually right, still need to keep the lambda running and then uh, pay, rather than, as you said, you have just a use and then you pay. But you always use as so you always pay. Uh, right? If the lambda act actively running, we need to pay for this. Uh, duration cost, yes. But yeah, I mean, it say this is a busy cache, right? Uh, if it's a busy cache, yes, the cost will be higher. Yeah. It, it depends on the inter-arrival time for the different requests, yes. Yes. In the center? Um, yeah, this is Chen from FutureWay. Uh, I think a fair comparison between Elastic Cache and your Infinite Cache is the memory footprints. So because you're doing Eurasia coding, then Elastic Cache is not doing that. To do. that's, that's where the benefit will come in from. So do you have numbers to compare your uh, memory footprint for, for the same workload running on Elastic Cache versus um, Infinite Cache? Uh, we have the same memory capacity between the Infinite Cache and Elastic Cache, which all, they are both have 600 gigabytes. Yeah, because we have 400 lambda cache nodes, and each lambda hash node has 1.5 gigabytes memory, so the total footprint, memory footprint, is the same. I mean, you're doing Eurasia coding. That's different. Uh, yes, we do the Eurasia coding. Yes, we will have some redundancy in this one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 we need, yes. On the side. Um, this is Nelson from Future Way. A uh, very interesting result. Um, I have a quick question about your functional claiming rate. Um, you claim that, um, I don't know whether, whenever you measure the function reclaim rate, um, do you measure it by like around the clock, 24 hours a day? Uh, in this experiment, we run experiments in 24 hours and we periodically to trigger the functions and we will, uh, we will like to summarize how many functions has been changed to different instances. Okay, yes. thanks. Hey, Nick Accumulo. Uh, I noticed you talk about latency, but did you talk about um, throughput numbers also? To like possible total throughput of elastic cast versus? Oh, since this workload is not, uh, I mean, it's not a very busy workload, so the throughput in this scenario is, I'm, I think, is way much lower than the latency, I, I think. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, Arjun from the University of Wisconsin. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, your system needs a single Lambda function, uh, which will take an output or a get request and return the cached item. Um, so my question is, uh, how in the Lambda environment, how do you achieve a binding between a particular request and the exact uh, instance, Lambda instance that it goes to? Uh, we have multiple Lambda deployments in our backend cache pools, so we can use the, uh, we have unique ID in each Lambda function, so we can track the ID to, I mean, direct to the, to the specific object you want to get or put. Um, so from the user point of view, how would the workflow be? So every time I create a new object, would I need to create a new Lambda function? Uh, you need to pre, I mean, pre-initialize the Lambda cache pools, yes. So this is a pre-configuration. Um, so for instance, in your, in the production workload that you showed uh, for Docker registry, so if I want to insert a new item into the Docker registry for the first time, uh, I'm assuming that I would have to write a Lambda function to 
uh, create a cache, like to get the benefits of caching for this object. Am I right in that understanding? You mean you, you want to claim the cache? I mean, um, no. So my question is: uh, every time I insert a new item, I create a new item. Do I have to create a new lambda function? That's at, that's the high level question that I'm. No, asking. no, no, no. We have already deployed the lambda function in the cache pool. You just insert it; it's fine. Okay. All right. Thanks. Time for one more question. We'll take it from here. Hi, uh, Vishwanath from Memory. Uh, how do you guys perform cache invalidations? Uh, cache invalidation. How do you guys perform cache invalidation? Uh, our cache is uh, read-only and read-through cache. So if if you want to, I mean, if if it's a write validation, we will uh, to uh, if you want to validate, we will insert a new one to the backup storage and to repopulate this object to the cache. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. Yeah.